Insects are one of the most abundant and diverse groups of animals on the planet. They make up the, like, probably the largest proportion of ecological roles in almost any land ecosystem. So I'd like to show you some of my favorites. Come with me. Hi, Pete. Hi, Tori. So who do we have here today? This is a Maclay's Spectre stick insect, which is a type of stick insect from northern Australia and New Guinea. Um, and so they perform a herbivore role. They're basically a leaf eater. So they're climbing up into the trees and bushes. They're gobbling up those leaves. Um, they're helping to regulate those plant populations to some extent. They're also, they're not an entirely, uh, you shouldn't look at them just as a pest because I find they're rather messy eaters. They drop a lot of like leaves and bits to the forest floor that are then composted right in place back into the soil. Um, but yeah, by eating the plants, uh, we can see that that's, that's a common one. We always know who's a, who's a plant eater, who's a, who's a meat eater. So we'll get to those guys eventually, but, but this is an important role and probably, you know, relatively low on the food chain. You've got the plants feeding everybody and then who eats those. Um, and so we're slowly working our way up. So her, one of her defenses is looking like a leaf. She looks so much like a curled up dead leaf that she doesn't really want to uh, give that up. Getting, screaming and running away would, you know, the jig would be up. Leaves don't do that. So she's going to sit still and hope that you don't notice her. Do that little shuffle we saw side to side that looks like she's dancing. But if she was in the wild and every leaf in the tree was fluttering slightly in the breeze, it would be very hard for you to differentiate the insect from the actual foliage. She's holding so still right now. Yeah, she thinks she's fooling all of us. As far as she knows, nobody's even noticed her. She's totally pulling this off. I'm a curled up dead leaf in the midst of the jungle and nobody even sees me. Right. So, I mean, not all insects are herbivores. We've also got a lot of predators. So let's, uh, let's go check out another one and we'll move our way up the food chain a step. So this is a praying mantis, right? They're predators? That's right, yes, voracious predators. So, you know, predators are animals that feed on other animals, and in so doing, they're regulating those populations of the prey, prey so that they don't overrun the forest, that kind of thing. So that it's important. Uh, praying mantises have very mobile heads and excellent vision, so they can actually turn their head to watch for their prey. They use this really great vision to uh, basically to just see, and as something comes by, they'll, they'll reach out and grab it with those really spiny front limbs there. Some of them are camouflaged. This one doesn't, you know, maybe blends in a little bit with my hand. Believe it or not, this is actually an African green mantis. So they come in two different color phases and they can change over the course of their life. So she molded to adulthood when it was dry. So she's taken on more of a dry leaf kind of look. Um, but if they molt when it's really humid, like when it'd be rainy in the rainy season, they'll turn a very brilliant bright green. So this is an animal that's camouflaged for a couple of different reasons. She's camouflaged to hide from her prey, but she's also camouflaged to hide from her enemies. Birds, lizards, all kinds of other animals would be more than happy to make a meal out of her. Now I do have some crickets here. We might even be able to feed her and watch her eat some. So as soon as she sees what she's interested in, doesn't feel like she has to look over her shoulder and watch for that bird or lizard that might eat her, she's more than happy to just grab a hold of that. Now there's no venom going on here, there's no stinger, this is just biting and chewing. This, I like to tell the kids that this is like you eating corn on the cob. Grab it with both hands, bite, chew, swallow, repeat. So we talked a little bit about herbivores and predators. What other kinds of animals do you have here? I think it's time to talk about parasites. <laughs> Let's go check out the ponte. So what's an example of a parasite or a parasitoid that we have here? We've got lots of them. Probably the most common one that uh, we encounter and quite unpopular as a result would be mosquitoes. We've got 32 species of mosquitoes just in the Edmonton area. So there's more than most people could keep track of. And uh, there, we certainly know that once they reach adulthood, the female mosquitoes will bite uh, any warm-blooded animal. There are some that will go after fish and amphibians in other parts of the world, but they're trying to steal that blood in order to build eggs. So most female mosquitoes cannot produce eggs without that blood meal. So it's an absolute necessity for them. And it's a risky thing, right? You're gonna try to swat them if they land on you. It's actually worth running that risk of losing their life to get such a payoff. And so those, every one, one bite from that mosquito, she carries that off and she can actually make an entire batch of eggs with that. Um, and although that's not a popular species by any stretch, nobody likes mosquitoes, uh, you have to consider what they're doing with that. So every one of those drops of blood that they manage to get away with, they're gonna lay a raft of eggs, those are gonna hatch, they're gonna be feeding on algae, bacteria, other insects in the pond, depending on the species of mosquito. They're feeding amphibians, dragonflies, birds, all kinds of things. So they are a really important chunk of the food web. Uh, in wetland ecosystems as well as on land. And it's kind of a great way to be bringing some of those nutrients from the wetlands out on, you know, uh, onto dry land. Think about those dragonflies that fly overhead and all those different birds. We 
you know, bats are, are taking down something like uh, 600 mosquito-sized insects an hour. Um, so there's a lot of things that really do rely on those. And that, I, people question this, they're like, well, so you don't swap mosquitoes? Oh, you swap them. But when you <laughs> miss them, don't feel bad. Know that it's going to a good cause. You're one drop at a time, one donation to local ecosystems. So mosquitoes really do have a purpose. Super important. So there's one other role that animals play, right? Definitely, yeah, we get, but probably the most important one. It sort of completes the whole cycle, but it's not popular with people, and that's decomposition. The decomposers help break down dead plant, animal, fungus, all that stuff, and by digesting it and, and breaking it down and essentially pooping out fertilizer, they're producing, the, they're re recycling those nutrients back into the soil. They make it uh, more readily available to bacteria, which will then convert it to a form the plants can use. So it's, it's all part of that cycle, and so when we talk about things eating dead, gross, rotting stuff. I mean, the kids scrunch up their faces, the adults scrunch up their faces. We're not asking you to eat this stuff. We're just asking you to think about, there's, it's a really important role, and I've, I've heard some stuff that, you know, the amount of dead could build up. If we didn't have things processing this, if we didn't have nature's cleanup crew and the recyclers out there, you know, that the rainforests would be piled as high as the forest canopy. You know, we could have a kilometer of filth covering the earth of dead and dying things. Uh, it's pretty important. You know, we don't have to wade through armpit deep uh, piles of dead on our way to work and our way to school. We have things like cockroaches and, and uh, millipedes and soil mites and stuff to thank for that. So roaches would certainly be one that aren't very popular with people, but that's a pretty important role that they play. So what kind of cockroach do we have here? So this is a giant tropical cockroach. Um, and one thing I like to point out to people is a lot of people encounter cockroaches in a motel or a restaurant that they have no intention of ever going back to. Um, there are 4,600 species of roaches on the planet and counting, and only about 12 of those can live in the house. So you only really meet the house pest cockroaches, but most of them would not survive on, in your home unless you were composting on the kitchen floor. These guys would not survive in your home, but they certainly could survive on the compost heap or even at the dump or something like that. Uh, but because they, they go after these sort of, you know, rotting fruits and vegetables, dead animals they encounter, um, it's a pretty broad diet, so there's a lot of different places that can support them. But uh, something I like to point out is the vast majority of cockroaches on the planet are harmless woodland decomposers that don't want anything to do with you either and would never find their way into your home. That being said, can we hold one? Definitely, yes, let's go for it. This one was closest. So hey, was that just sounds great. The Absolutely. Top one. You know who you're after. Yeah. And close your head. Yeah, there you go. Good job. Oh. So cockroaches are actually related to praying mantises and termites. Um, if you ever get a good look at a roach's head, you can kind of see they have similar mobility and, and that same sort of shape. Um, there's that pronotum, this little. Uh, shield sort of on the back of the head that protects their neck from predators so if that if that mantis was feeding on this one it would have to uh, flip them over or find some other way to get around I have even seen like bird eating tarantulas try to eat these guys and not be able to get the fangs through the wings so their wings are, are really quite leathery and tough and they'll work act as sort of a body armor for them as well can these ones fly they can fly like chickens so people will say chickens can't fly. Well, if you jump in the air and flap your, your arms, you're not going to stay in the air any longer than you would otherwise. But a chicken can. So these guys, they can basically maintain or lose altitude. So I've seen them fly in a straight line, and it's not uncommon when we're doing this for one to flutter to the floor and have to be recaptured. They can move really, really quick. And the American roach, which is probably half the size of this, can do 1.8 meters a second. Uh, so trying to catch them is a real challenge. So thanks Pete, thanks so much for teaching me all about the different animals we have here, the herbivores, the predators, the parasites, and the decomposers. I my, really appreciate it. <laughs> my pleasure, my pleasure. You can see that you know, almost, it doesn't matter what they eat, that there's still a very important role that they play. And I think that trying to encourage people to change their attitudes towards these critters and realize that they're worth more alive than they are stuck to the bottom of your shoe. Um, so yeah, hopefully people can come down for a visit and learn more about them next time.